Hello, everyone. My name is Rick Henson, and I am the incoming president of the BNA. I will be introducing our closing plenary lecture by Fred Gage in a moment. But before I do so, I'd like to say a few words of thanks to some of the people who have made this fantastic festival such a success. Indeed, I'd like to invite some of the key people to join me briefly online. So hopefully uh, Anne and Annette and Tara will uh, briefly join me. Uh, foremost to thank is Anne Cook and her team at the BNA, Louise, Sophie, Alex, Hannah and Joe, without whom none of this would be possible. Anne and her team have worked tirelessly over the last few months, planning how best to host an online conference and liaising with our providers, outsourced events, who've been very responsive and supportive. I'd also like to thank again all our partner societies, the UK DRI and our sponsors, who've contributed to the content of this festival. Another person I'd like to thank is our outgoing president, Annette Dolphin, who has worked hard to promote the BNA over the last four years, two years as president-elect and the last two years as president, particularly coping with the challenges that have been brought about by the pandemic. I know how much Annette was looking forward to seeing everyone in Brighton, but I hope that can happen in two years' time. I'm beginning to realise what a big task being president is, and I look forward to Annette's wise advice over the next two years as our president passed. I've heard that Annette is a very keen theatre goer, and I hope you've received some small token of our appreciation by post. And uh, I think you'd like to say a few words, Annette. Yes, thank you so much for the lovely flowers and the theatre tokens. I really look forward to spending these theatre tokens when the theatres open. So as outgoing president, <laughs> that's not my dog. As outgoing president, I'd just like to very quickly take my this opportunity to add my thanks to all the people that made this possible. The BNA team, our wonderful uh, CEO and cook, and all the staff. Um, who've worked so hard since last July when we made that uh, fateful decision to go online, which turned out to be absolutely the right decision. I also want to thank the programme committee chaired by Sarah Guthrie and Hugh Piggins, who've spearheaded, I think, what we can say has is a wonderful programme that we've all put together. Uh, and it's been a great success, I think, uh, given the circumstances in which we find ourselves. So, I'd like to thank Rick uh, for his good wishes and wish him all the best, best of luck for his future as president and uh, our future meeting in Brighton and um, look forward to seeing everybody in Brighton in two years' time. Thank you. Thanks, Annette. Um, looking forward, I'd also like to announce our new president-elect, who is Tara Spires-Jones, who is Professor of Neurodegeneration at the University of Edinburgh. I'm very, she's on the screen now. I'm very excited to work with her too and learn from her wealth of experience in neuroscience and more general science related issues. Finally, I'd like to thank you lot for attending the festival. I hope you've enjoyed it despite the problems of virtuality and the lack of Guinness. I hope to see you at our next festival in two years time, which we hope will be in person in Brighton and also to see you at the FENS 2022 meeting, hopefully in Paris next year. Indeed, please stay online after Fred's talk uh, if you want to help shape the next FENS meeting. Finally, if you're not a, already a member of the BNA, but have enjoyed the festival, then please consider joining our society. Details are on our website, and it's not a lot of money to contribute to your community and support the team that put on great events like this. Right, to return to the main feature of today, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Fred Gage, also known as Rusty. Um, I've already encroached too long in his time, so I'll only briefly highlight some of his many contributions. Rusty is the president of the Salk Institute for Biological Studies and the Adler Professor in the Laboratory of Genetics at the Salk Institute. And his work has focused on the plasticity and adaptability that remains throughout the life of all mammals. He has made many important discoveries, including, together with Ericsson in 1998, the finding that the human brain produces new nerve cells even in adulthood, contrary to the textbook, textbook dogma. He's won numerous awards, which you can find on his Wikipedia page, but the entry there that I like most was the rumour that Rusty is a descendant of Phineas Gage, the famous clinical case whose prefrontal cortex was destroyed by an iron tamping bar. 
because that entry is qualified with the addendum that this proposition faces considerable difficulties, chief which being that Phineas Gage had no known children. <laughs> As with all our plenaries, please type questions at any point during the talk into the questions tab of your live discussion box. Uh, Rusty has kindly pre-recorded this talk, uh, but he'll be back online at the end to take any questions. Uh, thank you again, Rusty, for taking, out, taking time to talk to us today, and I look forward to hearing your talk. Well, thanks for having me, and I look forward to answering questions at the end of the day. Hello. I'm uh, glad to be here. Happy to give this lecture for you. <clears throat> although it's uh, obviously more complicated <laughs> doing it through virtual presentation, but I'm, I'm hopefully I'll be able to communicate these ideas to you well. Title is uh, Age-Related Degenerative Disease and Genome Instability. I'm going to thank Jerome Mertens and Dylan Reed who led <clears throat> parts of these projects ahead of time. <clears throat> As I said, I'll divide it up in two parts. One is modeling aging with human cells, and the second part is uh, genome instability. These are two new yet uh, to be published papers in press. <clears throat> so aging itself is not fully understood <clears throat> why, we, why we age. Um, there are hallmarks, genome instability, epigenetic alterations, loss of proteostasis, mitochondrial dysfunction, and more than likely some combination of those reflects what aging really is rather than it being a single thing. What we do know, do know is that uh, aging is the major risk factor for many diseases, including many cancers, heart disease, and, and certainly Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. There are a lot of hallmarks of Alzheimer's which have been focus of a lot of research, including tau and tangles pathologically, as well as loss of brain tissue, loss of neurons. People have modeled this disease in a variety of experimental animals, usually by overexpressing mutations in the familial forms of Alzheimer's disease in cells and silicons, Drosophila mouse, but 95% of the patients are sporadic. So we're still not sure, sure how predictive the uh, familial forms of uh, Alzheimer's are of sporadic disease. Chose to use uh, the reprogramming technology in human cells from patients. In this case, we used old and young patients, took biopsies, isolated and purified their fibroblasts and differentiated them to iPS cells, a technology that we know is useful now for differentiating cells into a variety of tissues, including neurons. We have done this with a cohort of young and old individuals, starting one day old through 80 years old. And with fibroblasts, we can see clear differences, statistical differences in gene expression between old and young. However, when we convert the cells to iPS cells, we lose that ability to distinguish between old and young patients through their cells. And this is completely lost in iPS cells. We've implored uh, employed a second methodology of programming called direct reprogramming, where we take fibroblasts and overexpress pioneer factors in GN2 and ASCII1, and within a period of three weeks, the cells can be induced into neurons. This is presumably because these factors are pioneer factors, which directly direct the cells to become a specific lineage, in this case, neurons. When we implore this technology, we find not only uh, that does it work well, but the cells now represent old and young quite effectively. So we pulled out genes that are uh, uniquely expressed within the elderly population. One of the genes, for example, that we pulled out was um, RAMBP17, which is a nuclear poor protein, and it's decreased results in a decrease in nuclear integrity. Uh, we explored this and showed that there's an age-related increase in nuclear pore leakage over time as you age, which can be reversed and you don't see 
and use iPS cells, suggesting that this is actually a, a target for modification. So now we uh, have used this technology for directing INs and making INs and exploring a variety of age-related changes. We've made these vectors available through adgene and through sharing. And there have been several publications over the last four or five years showing changes in epigenetic methylation, stress survival, heterochromatin, and proteostasis changing with age using this methodology. One thing that we have shown using uh, sites associated with epigenetic clocks or methylation sites that the uh, INs and the fibroblasts from Asian individuals are correlated with uh, age, whereas older patients, our patients here, however, if we look at direct uh, IPS derived cells, they are more correlated with early prenatal time. So even with regards to methylation <clears throat> as a genetic marker of age, epigenetic marker of age, there is cap it's captured by these IN cells. And using um, the brain span um, atlas pump from Allen, where you take all the transcription factors that are associated most with early brain development all the way through aging. So you can map your genomes to this uh, <clears throat> transcriptome map. And when you do that, uh, you can find out where your transcriptome ends. We've done this and what we see is that for the INs during early development, there's <clears throat> our Gene expression patterns are not are have a low similarity score with early genomics, whereas the IPS ions are highly correlated with uh, this early time period. The INs are more similar to <clears throat> age-related genomes, whereas the IPS when in the are are not not similar to the INs sorry, to the, um, the age-related uh, genes in the Allen Atlas. So let's move to Alzheimer's disease. We've used 19 non-demented and 13 sporadic and a few familial cells, uh, patient cells for a comparison. <clears throat> We've differentiated all these cells into INs and they all convert both the AD and the controls convert nicely into neurons. They are highly represented by NUN, VGLUT, and GABA, pretty much the same proportion in all cases. The only population that shows an A-beta uh, secretion 4240 is the those that have mutations the, of the familial forms of the disease. We don't see this as has a, have not others seen in sporadic forms. So let's look at the differential expression patterns comparing controls and ADs. In the fibroblasts, we really don't see any difference using a volcano plot for differential expression between the controls and the ADs. However, when we look at the INs, we see a significant number of genes that are upregulated and downregulated, upregulated and downregulated uh, in this popula population comparison. They fall out nicely in a Tisney plot analysis. And you can see that the expression patterns also uh, are different using this diagnostic plot as well. Now, as a, as a way of determining whether or not the changes that we're seeing are similar to what are seen in postmortem. Uh, RNA-seq data, we've gone back to data that's already been published uh, from postmortem tissue comparing AD and controls. <clears throat> and the color code here is yellow being very similar and, uh, and the blue going down is also similar. So what we see here is that there's a high correlation between the RNA-seq from the postmortem tissue in both the upregulated and the downregulated genes 
for uh, comparing between postmortem tissue and the INs. So it's some level of, of validity. We've also taken a recent paper by uh, Grubman from Nature Neuroscience where they did a single cell sequencing from frontal cortex, postmortem tissue, and uh, reanalyzed their single cell tissue and then compared those with our INs. And what we see here is that there is a high correlation between the new in group of cells here that they've defined as, as uh, differentially expressed in AD and those that are overlapping with our IN cells. But we find very little relationship with uh, the other cells in their pool. So we think that this represents again, that our INs are, are recapitulating well the changes that are occurring in vivo in a postmortem tissue. Look at this a little more clearly, we can look at the uh, Alzheimer's disease genes that are downregulated in GO terms. We see synaptic transmission, nervous system development, rhythmic processes, cell-cell uh, uh, adhesion. And really what emerges is this idea that a basic identity of neuronal fate is downregulated in AD compared to the controls, exonal guidance, neural differentiation. So neuronal activity and synaptic function are all declining in AD. We confirm this by doing double labeling with SNAPS and, and PSD95, and we see a significant decrease in these markers in AD compared to controls. We've done morphological complexity analysis of the cells, and the cells from the AD brains uh, patients are significantly lower. And finally, we've done calcium imaging, so we can do live imaging of these cells, and we see a lower frequency of spontaneous network uh, activity with the calcium imaging in the INs compared to controls. If we look at the upregulated genes, interestingly, inflammatory genes, cell cycle genes, stress, uh, and, and apoptosis type genes, in addition to evidence for cell de-differentiation. <clears throat> so when we look at these, again, using an alternative analysis, many of the genes that are upregulated appear to be involved in cellular stress, apoptosis, cancer, and some stem cell signaling pathways. <clears throat> so we're trying to figure out what's the connection between these upregulated genes and Alzheimer's disease. It, it appears that there is, there's some evidence for the fact that the INs are, the Alzheimer's INs are de-differentiated or they've, and have lost their losing or losing their fate of neuronal fate. So one of the things that we do see associated with this is an increase in uh, RET, R, ROS signaling. So the ROS levels are higher, reaction, o, reactive oxygen species. And if we look a little bit more closely at that, looking at H2AX, which is a DNA repair associated uh, protein analysis, we see an accumulation uh, in the nuclei of the AD, but not in the controls. You can see this in quantitation here by nuclear fluorescence. And in addition to this, we see a, an increase in um, the amount of DNA content within the AD population, suggesting an attempt at cell cycle regulation. So we looked at that a little bit more closely and saw that cyclin B1 uh, is upregulated in AD, <clears throat> but so there is some evidence of cell cycle entry but it's not completed. So when we labeled the cells with EDU, we got no double labeling. So the cells were not completing their cycle, cell cycle. The cell fate um, seems to be unstable as I've shown you. And what about the epigenetic uh, identity? We used um, ATAC-seq to look for open chromatin as a marker of immature and progenitors. We know that immature cells have much more open chromatin relative to, to differentiated cell types. And here are the plots we see for um, AD 
ATAC seek peaks near the promoter region of genes, and we see an elevated increase in, a, in the accessibility of uh, chromatin in this region, shown here as well. So there's more open chromatin. If we look more specifically, what we find is that this the promoter region is significantly more accessible. And if you look at the sites there that are open, we find proteoglycans and cancer, metabolic pathways, apoptosis, all enriched for being open. So open promoter uh, target uh, at, the, at the promoter sites are associated with cancer, metabolic, and apoptosis genes. More specifically, when we do uh, DNA motif binding factors for INs, we find these genes that are associated with glycolysis, for example, LDHA, elevated in AD. HK2 is also elevated, suggesting that the cells are de-differentiating from their oxidative phosphorylation utilization or generation of ATP to a glycolytic form. And then we see uh, increase in cell stress uh, and um, stem cells. So DNA binding motifs for stem cells and cancer transcription are more accessible. Genes that promote de-differentiation transformation become expressed. Is this phenotype age dependent? So the question is, we have these uh, aged individuals <clears throat> that have all, all of them are aged and they all have um, Alzheimer's or half of them have Alzheimer's disease. Can we capture that Alzheimer's disease uh, in without aging? And the value here is we have two methods from the same patients. We can either do this direct conversion or we can make iPS cells. So we decided we just would make iPS cells from the same cohort that we'd shown in direct to ask specifically whether or not the iPS, um, the reprogramming of cells was a was um, would have a negative impact on identifying the phenotypes. Or put another way, could iPS reprogramming rescue the phenotype that we've identified in direct reprogramming? So we compared both the iPS derived neurons and the induced neurons from the same patients. We use the same vector to convert them into neurons. It's only that the, this cohort went directly from fibroblast to neurons and this cohort was induced into IPS, but they both became induced in neurons. And then we compared between the two. And quite strikingly in the IPS cells, we see no differences between Alzheimer's disease and controls. And likewise, in the iPS-derived neurons, unlike with the INs, we see no differences, no significant differences between the two. So iPS um, reprogramming of patients erases the differences between them, highlighting the idea that there is really a age-dependent requirement to be able to, to see this phenotype, these phenotypes in the aging brain. So neural differentiation allows for neuronal connectivity and brain activity and cognitive functioning. Sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which is what we're studying here, a sporadic form of the Alzheimer's disease, is an age-dependent pathological program, which promotes a neuronal self weight loss, a loss of neuronal functionality and circuitry, epigenetic destabilization, and activation of cell death mechanisms, as well as a partial but not complete cell cycle re-entry, and an increase in the utilization of glycolysis at the expense of oxidative phosphorylation. Interestingly, many of these uh, pathogenic programs are consistent with the transformation of cells from a somatic form to a cancer form in a, in a process called, uh, known as the Warburg phenomenon. I think this opens up new way of thinking about Alzheimer's disease and its relationship to aging. I just wanna highlight for a second that we did find in our RNA-seq in the aging uh, INs compared to the age match controls, an increase in reaction, reactive oxygen species, increase in DNA, and an increase in DNA damage 
pathways. So these are transcription factors associated with DNA repair, and they're differentially expressed in the young versus old. So there's a genomic instability in the total DNA content. So now I'd like to switch to talk a little bit more about the mechanisms of DNA instability in neurons specifically. And this, of course, is just to remind you that in Alzheimer's disease, there's a loss of neuronal identity. So she was an epic transmission, plasticity, differentiation, but a gain in these um, factors associated with neuronal stress. So what about, uh, what role does genome instability play in aging? There's a longstanding history of DNA damage theory of aging. We know that mutations to various forms of uh, repair proteins result in severe uh, neurological uh, damage. Uh, Mookie and colleagues have shown that there's an early neuronal accumulation of DNA double strand breaks in Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> and interestingly, when you, when you think about chronic DNA damage response, it triggers altered metabolism, proteostasis, downregulation of mitochondrial biogenesis. So this genomic instability is associated with a variety of things that we've seen in the previous uh, presentation that I just gave you. Now neurons preferentially uh, repair um, certain types of DNA. There is some evidence supporting the fact that terminally different differentiated neurons repair transcribed, transcribed genes, so activity dependency in some sense. And there's also evidence that uh, neurons can incorporate radioactive nucleosides uh, following DNA damage by unscheduled DNA synthesis without any damaging agents, suggesting that um, there's ongoing DNA damage. In fact, the estimates are somewhere around a thousand DNA damaging events occur every day in every cell. So there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of DNA damaging events that are occurring in the course of a lifetime. Most of course are, are normally repaired, but where does that repair occur uh, in the genome? Is it sporadic is one of the questions that we would like to ask. So to do this, we developed a methodology we're calling RepairSeq. We, we, we incorporate, allow EDU to be incorporated into the genomes of post-mitotic neurons. In this case, we're using iPS-derived neurons, ones I've described to you previously. These are not IN neurons yet. And uh, we can label um, DNA with this. So the way we do the quantitation is this is just qualitatively showing that you they do incorporate into nucleus as well as into cytoplasm um, mitochondria. We take post mitotic neurons, we label with EDU, we allow time for the EDU to incorporate into DNA damaged sites, naturally occurring DNA damaged sites, and then we use click chemistry, uh, including the biotin azide, make a library. Um, pull down with the biotin and then do PCR application of the beads. And then we do, do uh, next genome sequencing. Here you can see an example in the synuclein gene. These are hotspots of repair. So this is what we call hotspots of repair. This is repair occurring all along the gene, but they're only uh, in subregions where we get these hotspots, which accounts for about 1.3% of the genome. Um, it's quite reliable. So in replicates of the same line, we find high reproducibility of the hotspots and even between different cell lines, uh, IPS lines, we find very high correlation between them. When we look at the peaks, they have a, a, a general size of about 500 base pairs. So a pretty sharp band around the site where the repair peaks occur. <clears throat> and generally speaking, we find a higher amount of peaks found in the uh, five prime UTR of genome. To look more specifically at where these repair sites are occurring, whether or not it's in open chromatin, we did ATAC-seq, which you can see here, and we did CHIP-seq for HVK27 acetylation. You can see that there is an association. Some 
level of association between ATEC seek. Most hotspots are not associated with them. So more than 50% are not associated with ATEC seek, but most of the heavily repaired sites tend to be associated with ATEC seek and HK3, H3, 27 acetylation. There are regions of the genome generally around the promoter area called quadruplex, and we used ATEC seek that are associated with ATEC seek sites, and they're a, a, a folded DNA that had some structure, presumably important for transcription. And what we find is that those areas are highly repaired, meaning that they were are undergoing damage and repaired preferentially. Uh, at a very, very high level. And this is relative to, to sort of random site within the genome. So strongly enriched in promoters, these quadruplexes, and uh, a lot of repair is occurring at those sites. So what about transcription? So if you look at all areas of repair, not just the peaks, but just the repair, there is a correlation between um, transcription RNA-seq uh, and repair-seq. But if you look just for the peaks, there's really no association with transcription. So it's not just transcription alone, but if you look at where those peaks are occurring and look at their um, go terms, they appear to be in neuronal, primarily in neuronal areas. So what's happening is the genome is repairing primarily areas of identity, of a neuronal identity. We've only done this in neurons, so it'll be obviously important to do this for muscle and other tissues as well to see whether or not each cell type has a repair program specific to its cell type. We used um, a method to pull down proteins and do mass spec on proteins associated with chromatin that had been repaired. And when we do this, we find 79 uh, proteins that are enriched. And using a variety of databases of conformity, we can find that the genes, these proteins are associated with histones, H2A isoforms, and we've confirmed this by Western blots, as well as RNA binding proteins. So the importance obviously of these cells and cell identity and or these, these proteins and cell identity and DNA repair are, are interestingly linked to um, our hotspots, part of the chromatin. When we also looked at databases, we find that the consensus is that 21, 21 of the 79 are proteins that show abundance in those pr proteins that have been demonstrated to change with Alzheimer's disease and other uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And many of these hotspot proteins um, were found independently in a protein analysis of postmortem tissue that were associated with late stages of Alzheimer's disease. So here's our cluster analysis here. And then here's this mapping WGCA from Dan Geshwin's group and cell reports. When we looked at uh, epigenetic drift, and I spoke to you about this a little bit before, it, epigenetic clock can be used to measure age. And when we um, looked at the signal for uh, aging that's been identified for the epigenetic clock, we find that those areas of the genome in young cells are highly repaired. So there seems to be a preference for repairing um, sites associated with the epigenetic clock. So in general, we think that DNA repair, um, and, and others have uh, have shown this, and this is in a review by Carl Harrop some years ago, showing that there is a, de there is a decline um, and they're trying to be repaired, but with some events, Alzheimer's disease, DNA damage, there is a breakdown in the ability of the cells to repair the amount of or imbalance between the amount that can be repaired and the amount of damage that occurs. And that's when we, shift from the sort of normal decline with aging to a progressive loss. So we mimic this a bit by using DNA damaging agents. And what we find is that there is both a loss and a gain of peaks. So the location of where the gain and loss of peaks occurs. So 
one can see that there is a baseline healthy amount of DNA damage and repair occurring that preferentially repairs specific locations in, in the genome. But when that, that is lost, then there's a shift and some, some areas are preserved and others aren't. Another way of looking at this <clears throat> is to compare the repaired sites to those sites that have been identified as being lost with age. So several investigators, including Chris Walsh, a very nice paper in Science showing that there's an increase in um, SNVs, single nucleotide variants, with age and accumulation with age. So we mapped these uh, sites that have been identified by Chris uh, using a relative distance marker uh, to identify uh, distance between two genomic coordinates. And what we see is that there's, first of all, there's very little overlap between the sites that are repaired and those that are, uh, that show up pathologically as SNVs. And in fact, we see very little uh, relationship to them, sorry. Um, we've also used, a, another methodology to look for uh, genome evolutionarily conserved sites. So these are areas of the genome uh, that are very similar between many, many species, evidencing the fact that they're, they are conserved. So they're evolutionarily conserved sites. And while there's no relationship between, or no, no commonality or similarity between ATEC seek and repair for this for these SNVs, we find that there's a very high, uh, they're very, very, very close to these um, conserved evolutionary areas, uh, specifically the repair areas. So you see that um, repaired the uh, seek or these repair mechanisms are really trying to prepare, uh, preserve these evolutionarily conserved regions. So in conclusion, um, I'd like to say this last study, we've shown that DNA repair in neurons is not random. It's, uh, there are hot spots of DNA repair, accumulation of DNA repair occurs. Promoters, splice sites, DNA binding proteins, histones are targets of repair. In neurons, neuronal identity genes are peripherally repaired. It's interesting from the previous study, we showed that there's a loss of identity in Alzheimer's disease. And then there's evolutionary conserved regions of the genome that are also preserved. And finally, the biological clock, which is so valuable in predicting age is also protected by this repair process. So we, we hypothesize that DNA repair declines with age, and this might be the driver. This decline in DNA repair might be a driver in disease and that any perturbation that occurs to disrupt the hierarchy of repair could be detrimental to um, areas depending upon the disease type and where the damage occurs. So when thinking about DNA damage, using the analogy of the bullet hole misconception, the damage to the hotspots, that's where the repair is probably the most detrimental to the organism. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank Dylan Reed and Jerome Mertens in particular for this and the core facilities at the SOC as well as those funding the research. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Rusty. That was a inspiring breadth of uh, neurobiology that you covered there. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in uh, from the audience. Let me start with a few. My first is actually a, a, quest, a request for clarification. So in the first part of your talk, when you're talking about induced neurons from patients with AD, showing uh, down regulations associated with synaptic density and activity and up regulations associated with cell stress, I wasn't clear whether these were the sporadic or the familial AD or whether you'd collapse them. Because in one of your early slides, you show that uh, amyloid secretion was only present in the familial AD uh, cells. Um, so what, what you see, <clears throat> yeah. 
So we only have two or three uh, familial forms in our analysis, and uh, we did include those in the synaptic analysis. So we do see a decrease in synaptic function, both in the familial form as well as in sporadic form. But that analysis is dominated by the sporadic. There's something like 16 to, to 3 in those populations. When we separate them, and it's not really fair because the N is so small for the familial, we do see, but, but we do see a decrease in the synaptic function as well. We're increasing our uh, cohort of familiar forms and different types of familiar forms uh, in future analysis. But our real focus here is to try to take a look at the sporadic forms, which are so hard to analyze in most of the model systems we look at. <clears throat> and then my, my question was that how many of the um, differences that you observed in these, in these INs do you think would uh, be specific to Alzheimer's compared to other neurodegenerative disorders. So I, mean, I don't know whether you've tried this or what prediction you'd have if you uh, took induced neurons from uh, FTD or other telepathies. Yeah, so we are, <clears throat> we are doing that right now. I can say that we have done this for other diseases like uh, Parkinson's disease, and there's very little overlap. One of the, th one of the, in, in the, in, there's, there is, I should say it from the positive side, there is an overlap in issues related in particular to metabolism. So um, there, there's a core phenomena that seems to happen in these age-related diseases where they shift their metabolic activity from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis. And this cell cycle entry is something that seems to be ubiquitous. Uh, it, it, it deserves a lot more attention, but it, it is something that, that is emerging for us as a metabolic, there's a metabolic component to this whole thing that is really quite interesting. Yep. Um, right, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Uh, let me start with a, a couple from Annette. Um, so, uh, well, two questions here. Either are the synapses in induced neurons from AD patients different in morphology as well as having fewer synapses? And if you can hold that in mind, uh, is there any dip do you find difference related to APOE status? Yeah, there's not. Um, we don't. We don't have analysis on the APOE. There's. There's no. In the small sample we have, we don't find a relationship there. Um, the the caveat for the first part of that question is that we do find synapses defined by these immunomarkers, but when you go to the ultrastructural level, they're they're not as developed as you'd like to see, uh, well, you'd like to have to be able to make the kind of analysis that Annette is asking for. So there, there's enough variability there. We're using these really simplistic markers of, of synaptic formation. So they're very early on. Uh, we have now begun to use organoids where we can get uh, much more complete uh, synaptic structures and we're doing ultrastructure on those. And this observation at the 2D level has inspired us to make a, a more complete story. And hopefully we'll have a better answer to that in the future. Okay. Uh, and a question here from Tara. Do your results have implications for amyloid and tau-directed therapeutic strategies? <laughs> um, let's see. From a... I would say not a, not a lot of um, – phrase that question again because I want to give my answer in the context of the way the question was phrased. Uh, well, as, as written here, it says, do your results have implications for amyloid and tau-directed therapeutic strategies? No, I would say they don't. And since we're not really looking at those features, we don't get a lot of that um, in these – in these assays, I don't think this really informs it very much, one way or another. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so what's questions now from the audience? So Susan Chalmers asked, or says, first, fascinating talk, thank you. Is there any opportunity in the IN protocol to renucleate with nuclei from young IPS or to introduce young mitochondria that maybe haven't built up damage? Yeah, no, I think this is a brilliant idea and one that we are looking for collaborators to work on uh, to 
uh, the, the repopulation with mitochondria, with young mitochondria is one thing, or other kinds of pharmaceutical interventions that uh, increase mitochondrial biogenesis, some, some way of rejuvenating the, the mitochondrial function, I think is a, is a really good target. And we're very excited about that. The nucleation part is, um, is interesting. The fact that we lose all, most of the phenotypes when we reprogram to iPS cells heightens our interest in, in reprogramming itself as a way of rejuvenating cells. And there are some strategies that, that people at our institute, in fact, have been pioneering to try to do this in the in vivo setting. It's very interesting. <clears throat> okay, there's another question here from uh, Kislaine Katani. Uh, please forgive me if I mispronounce people's names. Uh, great talk. What are the genes that regulate the repair process and hierarchy of repair? Yeah, so there are hundreds of genes that are involved in the repair process. Um, and interestingly, <clears throat> neurons that are post-mitotic, at least these post-mitotic ones that we're examining, only use a fraction of the DNA repair capacity of the complete machinery. So there's some sorts of, of DNA repair processes that are not functional in, um, in our INs or in neurons at all. So it's a subset of, of these repair processes. Um, we, and, and I don't think I can tell you a really clear case that there's one repair gene that's involved. There's sort of a, a, a dampening. Um, and I, interestingly, here's even makes it a little bit more uh, confusing. There's, I, I term it a misregulation of repair because some of the repair processes are upregulated. Some of the genes are upregulated. So it's really a dysregulation or a misregulation, if you will, of the process. And it deserves a lot more attention to understand what that machinery is, how that machinery is uh, disrupted selectively in these neurons, which already have a minimal form of repair compared to dividing cells. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so Maya Hanspel asks, um, so very interesting that AD is a cellular program leading to loss of neuronal fate identity. Do you anticipate any similarities between AD uh, induced neurons and quiescent neural stem cells? Um, that's a good question. Um, the answer at the surface level is yes. And mainly because quiescent neural stem cells have more open chromatin. Um, so, you know, at that surface level, you were, we're seeing this move back in that direction. I'm not sure that that's the way to, you know, the most effective way to think about it because um, we also see this uh, loss of neuronal fate or loss of cellular fate in cancer, which is, you know, that's that's the one that's that's most intriguing to us is this idea of a, a Warburg effect where the, you have this dysregulation of an existing cellular somatic state back into a, a more immature state where cancer cells will go on to divide uh, we think that what's happening with the, the neurons as they de-differentiate is they more than likely go into a quiescent state or senescent state. So I would say the quiescent stem cell is more like the senescent neuron than it is like a, a, a cancer cell. So there's the analogy is, and I can say that we see a subfraction of these cells taking on characteristics of markers of quiescence. So within this larger population, there's a subpopulation of cells that have quiescence. And that's where maybe the, the correlation is best, but we're in the middle of that, uh, well, actually more toward the end of that, that sort of comparison, and we'll be submitting that soon. Very interesting. Um, Kevin Marinus asks, um, could you speculate on why age-rated neurodegeneration, neurodegenerative diseases shift towards glycolysis rather than oxidative phospho phosphorylation? Yeah, um, this is the focus. This is a real focus of our attention at this point. And let's say, let, let's think about it in a couple of ways. One is, what's the difference between them? Well, in, in glycolysis, you often use that when you really need rapid production of ATP, that there's, you know, 
something is requiring a more rapid, the, the slow turnover of mitochondrial and generation of lots more ATP is, is, is good for a quiescent cell who's busy doing lots of activities. When a cell is undergoing bombardment or undergoing stresses, uh, there's an evolutionary machine built into our cells, which, which drives them to generate quick ATP. So that could be part of it. That's not really a, I mean, it's more of a global explanation than a mechanistic understanding. Um, I should say <clears throat> that, so another way to look at it is very mechanistically and say, I showed you in some of the figures that you may not have seen that some of the genes that are involved, critically involved initial phases of glycolysis are upregulated. And the sites around those genes that are, are the chromatin area is open in these areas for some, so <clears throat> some mechanism is driving the opening of air of, of, of regions which are associated with the formation of, or the function of glycolysis are opening up as the cell is decreasing or uh, de-differentiating. So there are mechanisms in there for doing that. We need to look and understand that a lot better. But I, I think what Kevin is asking is, is, is a deeper question is why is this happening? And it may be a red herring to talk about this and in, in, um, it, it, it may be for a completely different reason that, that this is happening. It's just part of a machinery that is initiated as a function of stress and that these, these programmed machines. I, we're fascinated by the idea that um, increase in DNA accumulation and DNA repair and mitochondria, all these things, see, we think of them as study them almost in independent isolation, and yet they are, they're very much linked to each other. And, and uh, what these kinds of studies show us is just how linked uh, inflammation, DNA repair, uh, epigenetic mechanisms are to each other. And it's at the interface of those that I think that I'll, we'll be able to give a better answer to Kevin's really, really important question. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, another question here from Annette. Um, so are the BRCA mutations a risk factor for AD? BRCA? You mean can oh, okay. cancer? Oh, you know, there is a whole interesting story in the cancer field and the Alzheimer's field about the relationship between them. And I th think the story is that People with cancer have a lower frequency of Alzheimer's or one, one way or another. And I, I should have been prepared to, to answer that part of it. But there is, yes, there is an association between, and I, and I don't know about BRCA specifically. I should know, but I don't have it on the top of my head. But there is a literature on this that I, would, uh, that I haven't contributed to yet. But it's, it's out there. And it's a, it's a fascinating link between I think it's an inverse link between Alzheimer's disease and cancer and very some, some forms of cancer. So yes, in general. Um, another question here, a very general one. Uh, what are the mechanisms that regulate DNA repair? I guess that's quite a broad question. Yeah, and just, I'll, I'll give it a, 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 it depends on the kind of damage that occurs. In, there's different types of damage. You have double strand damage, and so there are repair mechanisms will, which will do either very selectively uh, clean repair of that double strand, or you can do blunt end repair. Other times, there's single point mutations that uh, occur, and that's a different sort of machine. And what it, it does, a set of proteins will grab a, a nucleotide, or, or in some cases, uh, a ribonucleotide, and put it into the DNA uh, as, as best as possible. So you can imagine there are a lot of proteins that are sitting there identifying and, and, and sensing the chromatin and then chaperones around looking for the environment for the, for the nucleotide that would best fit into that location. It's a, it's a whole, obviously it's a whole field of investigation and one that's really quite deep and um, machinery underlying it is evolutionarily, it's one of these things where it's amazing that over millions of years of evolution, there is involved this machine. But you can understand that having a machine that repairs DNA is crucial for the, 
for the survival of the species. And so this is a, you know, it's a, just a fabulous area of investigation. So if you're, if you're inter interested, there's a, there's introductory levels, and, and and as you get into it, more senior uh, advanced levels that you can learn lots about that. Uh, we ought to wind up soon, and I hope we haven't exhausted you too much. But there is another question here from Kevin. What are your thoughts on the contribution of de novo mutations to sporadic neurodegenerative diseases? Um, yeah. So, again, well, our data were, <laughs> were surprised because we looked at the the the, the um, the published data on sporadic, I would say, de novo mutations that have been published. And there are not that many. These are all at the single cell level being able to identify. Um, and then we looked at our hotspots to see whether or not there was any relationship. And it turns out that where the neuron is directing repair to occur is uncorrelated with where those sites of damage are it's and this is where we use that uh, analogy with the airplane is that um the repair <laughs> you know you can look at it this way this is really sort of a uh, sardonic way of looking at it is that those spots de novo spots that you detect are the ones that the cell decided that they're not worth repairing or less concerned about um on the other hand when we did our manipulations to look at um, what happens to the hotspots when you challenge the cells, they do shift to do repair other places, but when they shift to other places, they free up spaces where they were spending a lot of time repairing. So it's a whack-a-mole sort of game of trying to, you know, and, and you know, the, the other part of it is that, um, hopefully linking back to Kevin's question, one of the things that we learned early on in our studies was one of the things independent of disease is that mitochondrial function declines with age. And we're not the only ones who have seen that. We just see it here. So here you have a decrease in mitochondrial function, a decrease in ATP. You got these highly efficient machines that are busy repairing, costing lots of energy. So they're already compromised. And then you know, on top of that, you add a disease. I think this is where we begin to reveal um, where are the sites that become open. And that, that might be where specificity of disease comes in, where you have some disease, you know, certain areas of the chromatin become more vulnerable to damage in one type of disease versus another. And that might have something to do with phenotypic outcome. Great, thank you very much. Rusty, it's been brilliant. Thank you for giving up uh, your early morning slot to talk to us today. Um, okay. I uh, hope to see you in person at some point in the future. Right, uh, and congratulations for a very successful meeting and, and for you to coming in as president. Thank you. Um, just to remind everyone who's listening that uh, this is the last session today, but please stay on uh, if you want to um, learn about the FENS meeting uh, next year and contribute to the program there. Uh, thanks again to everyone who has helped make this uh, festival such a success. Um, and again, look forward to seeing everyone in real life at some point soon. So bye, Rusty. Bye, bye, -bye. Thank you.